GDEs are two letters better, actually. Uh, and G GDE is more exclusive. Um, so it's a program that Google runs for, for individuals who have contributed a lot in a specific area. And it's not something that you can volunteer to do. You actually have to get nominated from either someone at Google or another GDE. And then there's like a little qualification period and stuff like that. So it's actually really impressive that he came here to speak with us. Um, and Zeno's specialty is actually in web components. And I mentioned earlier that I'm working on a, a site uh, in Polymer right now, and it's all about web components. So I'm very excited to, to hear this talk. Um, to show how much of an expert he is, this is actually kind of like, shocking that he's this much of an expert. Not that you won't be this much of an expert, but you know we're used to speakers like me, you know. Here. <laughs> so uh, this is one of the sites that he created, Wait, and it's uh, yeah, we're up there, right? No, we're not up there. One second. Okay. Sorry, I, I, yeah, I mentioned the screen. I'm looking up there. OK, so this is customelements.io, uh, which uh, is the most popular web components gallery in the world. And for some reason, he was bored. If that was not good enough for him. So he also has webcomponents.org, which is totally different. It's not like just the same site, a different URL, two separate sites. So, um, so yeah, that's very impressive. So, uh, you know, it makes sense that he's a GDE. Um, I'll show you a little more about GDEs if I just say a little of our experts. <clears throat> so these are individuals that we can get you in touch with. Um, they often, I mean, part of their program, uh, it's not a job, this is something you know, that they do on the side, is to actually be active in message boards. So on Stack Overflow, various Google groups, things like that. So you can try to reach them too, but if you ever wanted to actually meet them or have a more in-depth conversation, um, we kind of have a lot of symbiosis between the two teams. There's a lot of GDGs who are GDEs, or GDG organizers who are GDEs, just coincidentally. So like Gerwin here and, and some others. Um, and so you know, we often have those connections from when we meet. So feel free to come to this list. Um, in Southern California, there's only a couple, actually. Um, now we're one more, but there's only a couple in Southern California. But feel free to come to this list. If you ever see somebody that specializes in something and you'd love to hear a talk, let us know, and we'll try to book them. It might be remote, it might be in person, but let us know. Um, so yes, look into that. It is very impressive. It's very exclusive. Um, and no, oh, this is getting longer. It's still exclusive though. OK, so uh, Zeno, come on up. Thank you. We're going to have you start. And we can ask for Hello. 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 Hello.
Uh, and I'm also like doing some stuff with Google uh, as part of this GDE program. Cool. So what I would like to play a little bit tonight is like trying to guess the future. Uh, and why is that? Like, I, I truly believe that the most famous client-side projects are faded to die. So if you think about Angular, if you think about React, I do believe that all of them are faded to die. Really, I believe that. And I believe Polymer is faded to die as well. Uh, but why is that? Like, if you see the technologies on the past, and we can start with Flash, uh, which, like, a couple days ago, they got the, the final punch in uh, Firefox is on. It's blocking Flash right now. Uh, but if you think about Flash, like, in the past years, if you wanted to do some graphical animation, if you wanted to do, like, some crazy stuff on the web, really cool transitions, really nice animations, you would need Flash or Silverlight, those crazy stuff. Uh, and you would achieve that in a really nice way. Flash was a really good tool. ActionScript was a really good language, uh, much better than JavaScript, I guess. Uh, but the problem is, it was a plugin. It was not accessible for everybody. And the platform realized, hey, like everybody wants to build animations on the web. They want to build those really crazy transitions. So they want to do this. They want to build animations. It's not about hyperlinks anymore. So the platform realized that. Everybody realized that, that need. So they put the Canvas tag. So how many of you know what Canvas is? Have you heard about HTML5 Canvas? Yeah, so when HTML5 came, uh, and there was this huge amount of new stuff, Canvas was one of the stuff. Like, right now, you can build animations, you can build games, and you can build all sorts of stuff using this HTML tag and this JavaScript API. So that's pretty cool. Uh, so we don't need that anymore. The platform realized that we don't need Flash anymore. Same with jQuery. Like, jQuery is just an amazing project. Like, if you think about eight years ago, doing DOM manipulations, DOM selections, if you need to touch the, the, the DOM tree, it was really hard. And this guy, John Rezik, he came up with this really tiny library and he said, hey, if you want to like, play with JavaScript, but like, you don't want to handle all those browser differences and all those inconsistencies, here's the library that you can use. And everybody was like, whoa, jQuery is so awesome. And then they started playing with jQuery. Designers started to jump into the web with jQuery. And something crazy happened. Like, people were using a library and not knowing the language itself. So jQuery is a library built on top of JavaScript. And everybody was using jQuery and not JavaScript. And they were like, oh, I don't know JavaScript but they were like playing with this library that uses JavaScript. So it was really crazy. And all the, like most of the, the success that jQuery had was because John Rasek realized that if he could select like elements on the browser using CSS selectors, that would be much easier. And he, he done that and people started to learn that and then the platform realized again, hey, people want to select elements using CSS selectors. So why don't we introduce this new API called document per selector? And now you can do the same thing. So for the past year, everybody, like, not everybody, but like, lots of people are starting to say, like, hey, do we really need jQuery? Do we really need all those kinds of like, libraries? Really, do we need that? or it's just something that we needed in the past and it's not needed anymore. And what about like jQuery wise, another good example. Like if you wanted to build like uh, a website to sell airplane tickets, uh, the basic thing that you want to put on this website is a date picker, right? You want to pick the date and you want to put that on your website. And how you do that? You just go to jQuery UI, you grab their code and put it there, and here you have a date picker. And people are doing that with other libraries and like, like 
the platform again realized, hey, we need something like we need a date picker in the browser. We need something that is a standardized thing, and this needs to run in the browser. So they include this new element, this new type actually called type equals date. Um, so cool, now you have a date picker on your browser. So all those libraries, they were built to fix and to fill a gap into the platform. But then like the platform realized, hey, everybody needs this, so let's put this on the platform. Uh, so, like, so you think everything will become native one day, native on the platform? Uh, that's not that's not, not what I'm saying. Like, many people are creating crazy stuff, amazing stuff. And the things that are like really crucial, sometimes someone that doesn't work at Google or Microsoft or Mozilla, they find something pretty awesome. And they put it on the web. And then everybody starts to use that. If you do something like this, this will probably become native one day in the platform if it gets really popular. And that's what happened with the other projects. So I guess those really, like jQuery, jQuery Y, they are faded to die because they, they were born to fill a gap in the platform. And they fill it so well that the platform realized, hey, we need this, and they put it there. And if you think about what the major web companies have been working on, there's, there's some kind of pattern. Uh, you guys know Twitter, right? What about this guy? Bootstrap. Bootstrap is nowadays the most famous open source project on GitHub. It's insanely crazy think, if you think about Bootstrap. Bootstrap is a CSS file and a JavaScript file. And that's all it is. And you put this markup, you follow these CSS classes, you put it in your page, and it works nice. And you can start your project with that. And OK, that's a good starting point. So Bootstrap, it's all about those little components that you're going to put in your page and assemble a big application with that. So they were thinking about components. They were thinking about, we don't want to like create the same nav bar in all pages on Twitter. We need to do this in a standardized way. So they create this library to do that. If you think about Facebook. Uh, Facebook came up with React. They want they wanted a better API to build components. Like they want to build this news feed and then share it some functionalities across other pages. They are building the messages. They were, they want to share the, some of this stuff, but they want to do that in a good way. So they come up with React. If you think about Adobe. Uh, Adobe has this project called Topcat. Topcat. Uh, which is just a library with UI elements that you just put like a button on your page, you put like a drop down, and boom, you have it. If you think about the library, the company that I work for, we have this project called Alloy UI, which is a bunch of CSS and like components like buttons, models, dialogues. We have all that. If you think about Yahoo, uh, in the past they had like YUI. Now they have pure CSS, which is, again, just components, just pieces of code that you can just copy and paste and you put in your page and boom, you have this really nice table, you have this really nice X, this really nice Y. So it comes down to like this. We're building an application. You have all those elements. But I don't want to recreate this chart all the time. Like it took me hours to figure out the calculation to do all this and if I change the data something happens I don't want to rebuild this I don't want to rebuild this I don't want to rebuild those pieces because if team A do this chart this way the other team will implement it in another way and then the other team will implement it in another way so all those companies they have this problem internally they are like doing the same thing again, you know? And nobody wants to spend time rebuilding the, the wheel of time. So how we create a component nowadays, a component? Like, what do we mean by a component? So let's say your boss came to you and said, hey, we need a carousel on our page. 
those annoying things that keeps like passing <laughs> images all the time. Cool. So the first step is you never create. All right, it doesn't make sense. I don't want to build all this logic, all this JavaScript that when you click, moves this way, and then when you get to the last item, what you're going to do, you're going to cycle it or move back to the other, and you, you have all these logics, and then you have all these browsers to support, so you're not going to create anything. So you go to Google, and you just pick a jQuery plugin, right? So you start to see like the results, OK? And if there is a result like this, like the 45 best jQuery Caruso plugins, oh my gosh, they already did the job for us. We <laughs> click on that, and we're going to pick the first one. Or the one that looks pretty much similar to what we want, what the designer and the team want. And we pick that. And if the designer wants something different, or you need to update that, or you need to maintain that, you know what's going to happen, right? So the second step is you just copy and paste their code. So you go to GitHub or whatever they hosted that. You grab their JavaScript. You get, grab their CSS. You don't even have any idea what's going on. You just copy and paste. Like, what is this? I'm not sure. What is this? Whoa, what is this? Like, I don't, I don't really care. I just want to put this component on my page. And the third step, you just hope it works. <laughs> if it works, awesome. So you can just like cheer it up, oh, oh, that's awesome. Uh, but if it doesn't, you got a really big problem. You have a piece of code that you don't know how to maintain. If there is a bug, you're going to be in trouble. So you've got all those problems. So that's why web components is important. Like Web components is a specification from W3C. Uh, it started with some guys from Google, uh, and now it's getting more and more popular. So basically, what you can do with web components, you can do a bunch of stuff. But one of the the main things is that you can create your own HTML tags. So you have A for links, you have B for paragraphs, you have uh, table element. We have all those HTML elements that we are pretty used to, right? Uh, but now we can create our own. Like I can even create a GDG LA element. I want to create that, and uh, my element will look like this. This is my element, and it's just there in the page. So what this element does, right? What is the behavior uh, behind this element? Uh, like maybe I want this element to behave in a certain way depending on the light. So can we turn off the lights a little? Can we turn on again? Not doing anything. So you can do an element. Like that. <laughs> what? That's insane, right? It's cool. And like, okay, let's let's inspect. First thing, double click. No, no, it's not flash. Uh, let's inspect that. <laughs> this is my whole document. Can you see it? No, right. This is my whole document. This is the head, importing some stuff, importing my elements, and then I have the elements. Just an HTML tag. And I can see it here. HTML head body, and I have this tag. That's pretty awesome. Right? I could also extend existing tags. Like nowadays, we have the video tag. Uh, one of the tags that came with uh, HTML5. And this tag is extremely awesome. Like in the past, you had to use Flash or other technologies to just put a video on the web. And now we have this tag, uh, which is pretty insane. Uh, but what if you want to grab the webcam from the user? You guys know how can we do that with JavaScript? Is that possible to grab the webcam from the user? Uh, there is a an API called uh, get user media. So we can call that API. We can either fetch the audio or the, the video from the, the webcam. 
And when, once we request that API, the user has to accept that. Once the user accepts that, we grab the stream from, this, uh, from the webcam, and then we need to put on the source of the video, and then we play the video. So we have all the steps that you need to do if you want to play with this Get User Media API. But I don't want to play with the Get User Media API. I just want to extend some existing element and make it more powerful. I want to make it as a video camera. So I could just... Open this element, and the first thing it's it's gonna ask me if I wanna like, provide, like, give my image, my my camera. This is really important, right? I don't want somebody to grab the image from my webcam, and I don't know. So I'm just gonna allow that. Ooh, oh, that's great. <laughs> and if we inspect that code. HTML, some stuff on the head, body, video is camera, and I, glo I, I got the glove from my, from my uh, webcam here. So that's pretty awesome, right? One tag and you can do all this stuff, and you can go really crazy. This is just some, some stuff that I created, but you can go really crazy with that. Um, so remember when I was talking about all those companies and what are those companies doing? Uh, but what about Mozilla? Uh, so Mozilla is doing XTags, which is uh, a web components library. Uh, they are implementing this and like using all the specifications that we're going to see what exactly they are, and they are building this. And there are some projects using it. I don't know if you guys heard about Firefox OS, but Firefox OS uses Brick, which uses XTag, which uses web components. Uh, this is one of the projects. What about Google? Uh, you probably heard about Polymer before. So Polymer right now is like, whoa, this project is so awesome. Uh, and it's really nice. And all those elements and the elements that I'm going to show in the rest of the presentation, they are built with Polymer. Uh, so it's a really nice project. Uh, and Polymer, like the first public appearance was in 2013. Uh, they announced it like, hey, we have this project here, and we're, we're playing with that. Uh, and then they, like, they tried to explain to everybody. Lots of people were really excited. They were like, whoa, this is going to change everything. Uh, many people were like, what? What is this project like, doing? They're trying to solve a lot of problems at the same time. They had a lot of layers, and like, they tried to explain. It was really uh, messy, but a lot of people were really interested. And one year later, on the other Google I.O., they announced more cool stuff about Polymer. But at the same time, like they were doing, saying, like, hey, this is something that it's a developer preview project. We're like working on this. This is going to change the API. And it did, and it broke a lot of people. Uh, so they were like changing a lot of the project. Uh, at that time, they released the core elements, the paper elements. This was in the same I.O. as they announced material design. So everybody was crazy about material design. Oh, this new design language, this is awesome. And Polymer, they built this paper elements, which are like elements built with Polymer that implements the same design language as material design. So that was pretty cool. And about two months ago, uh, on the last I.O., they announced Polymer 1.0. And they said it's ready for production, and now you can use it and be happy. Uh, they announced a lot of stuff. Uh, they announced, because the, the Polymer team, they work on the library, but they also work in element collections that you can use. So they have iron elements, paper elements, Google Web Components that you can connect to Google APIs with just one tag. You have Neon, Platinum, you have all those stuff. Pretty nice. And this is what, what the Polymer team is doing uh, nowadays. 
like you have the element collections, you have iron elements, you have paper elements, you have all those things. And then you have polymer. Polymer is the sugar library in the middle of that. You have web components JS, which is a polyfill, because web components it's still being um, they're still writing the specification and deciding what they're going to do. So you have to use a polyfill on the web if you want to use it today. So you have this optional polyfill that one day it's going to die, and then you have the browser APIs. You have custom elements, you have HTML templates, you have Shadow DOM, and you have HTML imports. And this is what we call web components. Uh, web components is this umbrella term for all those specifications. Uh, in the past, there was this decorator's uh, specification as well, but it's, it doesn't exist anymore. Right? It wasn't continued. Uh, but that's basically it. it. In the same way that everybody used HTML5 as an umbrella term for all these new APIs that were rising, same thing now. Like They were there calling web components as this umbrella term for shadow DOM templates, imports, and custom elements. You can, use in the, you can use them separately, and they're really awesome separately, but if you combine both, which is what Polymer does, you can achieve cool stuff. So this is my idea with this talk. Like, I want, it, I want you to live like this, like, oh my gosh, so much stuff, so much nice stuff, uh, but I want your heads to hurt by the end of this. That's my goal. Uh, okay, so custom elements is the, the first one. So the idea behind of custom elements is creating your own element. Uh, it is that simple. Uh, so if I wanted to create the GDGLA uh, element, uh, I just put that on my page, and then I, with some JavaScript, I need to register that element, and I need to give some life to that. So the way we do it uh, is pretty much the type we create an object based on that. So we're like extending the HTML element prototype, and we, we are like registering this element based on this prototype, and then we have this lifecycle callbacks, which are functions that are triggered where, when something happens. So when the element is created, this created callback is called, and this is what happens. It's going to just put menace inside of the tank. That's pretty much what, what you can do with uh, with the custom elements API. So this custom elements specification, like they declare how a component, what is the life cycle of a component, like what it should have and how it should behave. Uh, and you have all those callbacks. You have created callback, which is why when it's created, attached, when it's attached to the page, detached, and attribute changed. It's not only about creating your own elements, you can create your own attributes and then you can put it whatever you would like there. Uh, and here's the same thing using Polymer. Uh, so Polymer is the sugar library, right? So they are like building stuff on top of the specification um, and they try to do it in an easier way. Just as like jQuery was the sugar library on top of the JavaScript uh, DOM API, they are doing this with web components. So you can just import Polymer, and then you define this non DOM module, which is a type that they have created, and then you register your element. Just like the way you register it like this, they're registering much easier, like Polymer is the GLA. And then you have a tag. Uh, it's not doing anything, I'm just registering a tag. That's pretty much it. Uh, the life cycle is pretty much the same, but they just removed that callback suffix, which is like really verbose. Um, cool. So we know how to register new tags. So we can create new tags. The other part will be templates. And, and what is that? Like templates is not a new thing. We have been hearing about templates all the time. Uh, like templates are just reusable blocks of code. Because that's the simplest definition that we can uh, say about templates. Uh, and on the server side, if you guys already played with Java or Python or Node.js, you probably heard about handlebars, velocity on Java, Jinja, Liquid, Mustache, 
So you have all those server-side libraries to handle templates. On the client side, it's the same thing. Uh, you have Jade, you have Mustache, you have Echo for CoffeeScript, you have Handlebars again, you have Hogan. So you have, we have all this, like, this ecosystem of libraries to help you reuse blocks of code. And they tried to achieve that in a bunch of different ways. The first attempt of building a template is this. So what a template is, is I want to get this block of code and I want to reuse it, right? Cool. So the, the first thing that can, can come to your mind is like, OK, so I can just, I want to reuse this image. So what I'm going to try to do is wrapping this image with this div tag. I'm going to give an ID to that called template. And I'm just going to display now. This is not going to show to the user. This is fine, right? We're not showing to the user. So we can reuse that block of code with JavaScript and put it in our page and do some stuff with JavaScript and put it there. But here's the thing. If you put an image with display uh, known, the browser will still request that image. You're going to still like go to the server, request that, bring the asset. It's not the user's not seeing it, but you are like getting information from the server. And we don't want to do that. We don't want to waste bandwidth uh, with our template because in this case, it's just one image. And what is the size of this image? What if we have like ten images? What is the size of those ten images? So this doesn't work at all. The second attempt, it was, it was what <coughs> Handlebars did. So you have the image tag, and they wrap it with a script tag, because if you wrap with that, then you're not going to request that, that element. And then they put some weird uh, mime type. So this actually works, but it's pretty hacky. Like, you can see that uh, this is not supposed to be right, you know? and. Uh, and there's a lot of problems around security and uh, script injecting that you can uh, you can just do with that this kind of solution. So the same way that the platform realized that hey people want to build graphics on the web, let's give this canvas on it. People want to build date pickers on the web, let's give them this input type date. Uh, the web began to realize people want to reuse blocks of code. Let's give them a template element. That's what we have right now. So the way you create templates, really straightforward. Like you have an image, you wrap that with a template tag. It is that simple. Uh, and I'm just going to show how it works really quickly. So this is just a document with an image. Okay. Uh, if I open this on the browser. What's going to happen? This image is going to be loaded. Okay, so no big deal. Like I'm, I'm going to see the image here on my. The image is being loaded. Okay, working as expected. But if I just wrap that with a template. then this image is not being shown to the user and either being requested by the server. So that's a really powerful tag, just by doing that. And then with JavaScript, you can play with that. And like, I want to change the content and not play that cover, but show some different image. I'm just going to remove this. So here I have a div, and I have this template. I want to like get this template change the content and then put inside of the div. That's what I want to do. So what I can do is like, first of all, query selector the div, query selector that template. And I want to get the content. This is the important part. You get the content from the template. And then I'm just changing the source of my image. I don't want that image anymore. I want the other one. And then you just clone that node. So this is really powerful. We're like getting this element, manipulating it, cloning it, <coughs> and then putting it out there. And we can do that 
over and over. Like, imagine we we're building a Google Drive. So I have all those, all these elements on my list, but I don't want to like recreate the same block of code all the time, you know? Like I have pretty much the same stuff. I have this information, I have this, and I have this tool tip. Uh, so like each one of that is like a tip soup. This is the problem that Web Components solve. Like you have this incredibly huge dip soap on your page. This doesn't mean anything like to a, a, a search engine. Of course, Google Drive, like you don't want your files to be found on Google, right? Google search, of course. Uh, so that's pretty fine for applications like this, Facebook, Gmail, Google Drive. But if you're doing a website, if you're doing an external application, and you have things like this, what is the meaning of this for a search engine? Right. So semantics, like forget about semantics. You know? This is what those applications are doing. So with templates, we can like reuse this block of code. This is just one example that could be used. And then we can just not recreate the same thing. So we know how to create elements. We know how to reuse blocks of code. The third part is about encapsulation. And this is where Shadow DOM comes in. So Shadow DOM hides the implementation details from you. And it's been hiding information from you for a long time. Um, have you ever think about the video element? What is that video element made of? What is the, like, if I go to the, to my browser and I, like, I have this page, it has just a video, and I'm just going to open that, and I want to inspect that. I can play, pause. I just want to inspect this. So a video element has all these controls, right? It has the play, pause, you have the volume, you have the full screen button. You have, there is a lot of behavior. There is a lot of implementation behind this single element that you see. And each browser just do it different ways for each of them. On Firefox, this is how a video element is implemented. Like different controls, different UI, different implementation. So Shadow DOM hides all that for us. Like, I can't see what is this, this video made of. This is just a huge block for me. I can't interact with that. Actually, I can now. So if you go to the settings and you enable Shadow DOM, mm, this thing here, open now. Okay, so this is the shadow root. And now I can see that this is actually a div. Inside of that div, I actually have two other divs. One for the, oh, that's cool. I can like see the player and see that they're actually using the input type button to play, create this. They're actually using the input type range to create this. And they're, they're using all those stuff that we, we developers, we can use with HTML5. And they're actually using it to build the video element. And not only the video element. Uh, the input type date, same stuff. You have this date picker, pretty cool. Uh, and there's a lot of logic. If you already tried to create a date picker, you, you know the not an easy task. And you can actually see what is the, this input type date is made of, and you can like check an implementation, and you can see all those things. So Shadow DOM hides that for you. And even for an input type password, like I can just start typing my 
password, and then I can see the content from my password. Hmm. So this is what Shadow DOM does. Uh, and the way you create a Shadow DOM using JavaScript is pretty nice as well. So you imagine you have this page, okay? This is pretty, like, pretty small, so keep up with me. So in the head, we're defining that all the H1s are going to be green, right? All the H1s. All the titles of my page are going to be green. And then I have the full, the that title H1 uh, with content foo, I'm gonna like create a new, creating a new H1 using JavaScript, and what is the, the behavior that you expect from that? You expect all the H1s to be green, right? Let's open that. Okay, all the H1s are green. Um, that's how the web works, that's how it, CSS and JavaScript works. Um, but what if I like create a new style tag and tell that now I want all my H1s to be red? So this is gonna override the other one, right? So now all my H1s are red. But here's the problem: like I have a component that has an H1 and can have like hundreds of H1s, and I want all of them to be red. I don't want to have a CSS class. I don't want to have a namespace. I don't want to do what Bootstrap does. What Bootstrap does is they use this BTN class for buttons. And then you put Bootstrap on your page, and then you're creating a website. And if you want to use that class, you can't, because Bootstrap already put that theme, and then it's reserved for Bootstrap. You can override it, of course. Um, but you get this weird sensation that there's no encapsulation at all. You're just putting names for stuff and namespacing, which is just a silly way of, of handling that. So what we can do with, with Shadow DOM is like I can I can create um, creating this subdom in the tree and now I'm attaching that bar title in my style definition to that. So now what I actually get is even styling, like this is a global styling, right? We're saying all H1s needs to be read. And, but all the H1s in this context, in the context of the shadow root. So if we inspect that, we can see this shadow root, which is like the subtree in a DOM. And everything that is inside of that tree is encapsulated. It's not going to leak to, to your document. So you can have um, a model, you can have a carousel, you can have anything you, you can you can imagine you can encapsulate that. So no more need for namespacing or like creating single tones in JavaScript just to make sure that other people are not gonna access that. So there's a lot of things that shadow them. Yeah. Good question. Can it also load the whole script library independently? Inside of that? Yeah. You can. Uh, but most of the, the libraries, like jQuery, uh, they put this global object uh, on jQuery's case, is like this dollar sign, and then you can use that on your page. Uh, what's going to happen is that it's going to be globally on that subtree. And if your document, your main document, tries to access that, it's not going to work. You're not going to be able to use jQuery stuff because it's encapsulated on that part. So the external global variables are not going to be exposed inside of the no. point? So you have to load everything? Yeah. Like, an example of that is, 
I'm defining all the H ones to be green, and I'm creating the subtree, and I have this H one inside of that subtree, uh, and the accept the expected behavior is R to be black because that's the default color. So this works for style and scripts. So we know how to create tags, we know how to reuse blocks of code, we know how to encapsulate, but how you load all that? That's HTML imports is for. So HTML imports, it is simple as using the same link tag that we have been using to load CSS files, just changing the rel attribute to import. That's all you need to do. And now you can load HTML documents and not external CSS, but actually having external HTML documents. And those documents can contain styles, scripts, and markup. So if you think about all those stuff, like that this is pretty awesome, right? But there's a lot of things that are really crazy about this. Uh, there's this really nice tweet from Bruce Lawson that he says, web components rock, but making your whole app in one tag is the 2013 equivalent of making all your sites, text and image into a big grade, into one great big JPEG, right? In the past, we used to like just put this whole image and you cannot click, you can't do anything. Uh, and he's complaining that like you can create your whole app and call like Google search, and now you have just one element on that. So that you can do that. There's nothing preventing you from doing that. This other tweet from Jeremy Ashkinas is, is also really awesome. Um, web components, the funny notion that hiding your JavaScript widget behind an HTML API will make it smell better, right? There's a, there are tons of like really bad jQuery plugins, really bad uh, Dojo plugins, really bad Angular components. There's like there's a lot of well, bad code out there, and with web components and all the power that it provides for the users, you can do a lot of really bad stuff as well. Uh, and there's nothing we can do to prevent that. There's a there's like huge powers, huge responsibilities. That's that's what happens, right? Uh, but what about all browsers? You know, and I'm not pointing to any specific one. I'm just saying, like, what about old browsers? You know, what's going to happen? Because there's all this new stuff, new specifications, and how is the browser support for all of them? Uh, there's this website called Are We Componentized Yet? which tracks the the evolution of the specifications and how they're implemented on different browsers like Firefox, Chrome, Safari. Uh, this Chrome, it has full support for all the specs. So you don't need any polyfill, you don't need any code that is going to simulate the behavior. Uh, Firefox, there's a lot of tension going on because uh, in one side you have web components, which is pretty awesome, lots of new stuff. In the other side, you have ECMAScript 6. We have a lot of new stuff coming. A lot of new stuff coming to the JavaScript language itself, like ES6 modules. So how HTML imports of ES6 modules are related on the same page, this is something that uh, they are discussing on how to do it. Safari, they are the new IE. Uh, and the reason why I say that is because they are really close. They don't share any information. And IE is actually making a really good progress. Yesterday and the day before, they released two awesome articles about uh, web components. And they actually put it on, on the, on the status.modernIE. This was yesterday uh, that HTML templates is in development on Microsoft Edge. That's pretty awesome. And what about interoperability? Like, what about putting this and how, like, if you have a, uh, your application and it's made with AngularJS and you want to put some React components on the same page, it's going to break, right? It's not going to work at all. Or the performance is going to be, like, terrible. Uh, so how can we interrupt those technologies? Like, Angular, for example, the new version of Angular, Angular 2, they're going to support web components. And by doing that, if all the, the frameworks starting to adopt those specifications, 
you can have an Angular stuff in the same page as a Polymer stuff in the same page as a React thing. Um, React, same thing. Uh, they introduce a lot of stuff that uh, introduces the possibility of to consume custom elements and interrupt with those libraries and make cool stuff. Same thing with Ember. Uh, the new version of Ember, they uh, they are already using the custom elements API. So this is pretty awesome, right? So there's a lot of potential going on with our components and a lot of stuff that developers can use and build. But how can we can, can I find like the video camera element? Where can I find the GDG LA element? Uh, what is the best place? Should I go to NPM? NPM is more for Node, right? So there's a lot of front-end stuff there, but should I go to a package manager like NPM? Or should I go to Bower, which is a package manager for the web? There's a lot of projects that are hosted there for the browser. You have all those options. But what I'm going to search there, like if I search for carousel, there's going to show tons of carousels made with jQuery, made with React, made with all those components that don't interrupt with themselves. So there's not a, there was not a place for that. Uh, so that's why uh, we created customelements.io. So this is a place that you can just go, look for something crazy. Like there's this X GIF element. So you can just put a, a GIF on your page and like control the playback and all that. Uh, there's this HTML JL which is an element that you can put shadow, uh, not shadow, no, you can put shaders and WebGL on your page just using uh, HTML elements. This is really cool. Uh, and the way you put your element out there is you either use Bower or NPM, doesn't matter. Just include the web components keyword inside of your Bower JSON, packet JSON file. That's pretty much it. Uh, and you can go like crazy with elements. Uh, one thing that is pretty pretty common and that happened to me like you are building a website and you need all those social buttons right you need the Twitter the Facebook like you need the Google plus one you need github stars you name it there's a lot of social buttons and then you put all, everything there you put all you need and then you create a new project and then you're like oh how can I import those things? So you go back to that project, copy and paste. Uh, and that's what those services, they provide you, like a, a code for you to copy, paste in your page, and that's it. Um, but what if you create a, like a Twitter button element, you know? You can just define an element. You can put like, what is the type of my Twitter button? Like, can we follow? You can put some user. Just put in mind. And I can open that in the browser. Let's check it out. So there you have it. With just one line of code, just one tag, you can have a tag like this. Or maybe I can change this to a mention. I don't want to follow uh, my user, just I want to mention that. And I don't want to mention that user. I want to mention G, uh, GDGLA. Now I can tweet GDGLA. Cool, right? Uh, no more copy and paste and stuff. You can create that video camera element, which is pretty nice. And you can extend in different ways. Uh, you can even enhance that element. Like, this is pretty awesome, right? by itself, like I don't need to have the camera. This is this is pretty cool. But you can also create attributes, right? So I created this one called filter. And I really like Instagram, you know, hipster guy. So I'm just gonna put the sepia filter. So now I look cool and I can take a selfie and I can publish it a lot of places. And you can 
also integrate with different APIs in the browser, right? Uh, in the beginning, I showed how to use the ambient light API and detect the lights and do some behavior. In that case, was blinking and, and then doing something else. But I can use the web speech API. So this one, I hope it works. Okay. Okay, so you have just one element like voice player. I can define attributes like accent and I can put some text. Like, Me gusta la gasolina. Me gusta la gasolina. Dame más gasolina. Cool. Uh, you can change like Los Angeles is great. So you can use like speech synthesis, which is like telling, like, say, like defining, like given a text, say this. You can, uh, and you can have just with one element. Um, in this case, is the voice player element. But you can also have the opposite way, like detecting what I'm saying and then showing on the screen, which is voice recognition, right? Hope this works. <laughs> Los Angeles is great. Wow. <laughs> so I'm not doing anything. I'm just robbing the web speech API. But this is amazing, right? Uh, you can also like do a lot of crazy stuff. Like this is really crazy. Um, so like last year, uh, like I got together with some friends and uh, like it's actually my boss and he's like oh he, he was doing his masters in computer vision and working with and studying all this computer vision stuff uh, and he decided to create this library and we're like jump into that and like let's do this and. Uh, we just started creating this, and with this library, you can uh, detect colors and detect like faces or stuff like that. So here I'm like detecting the face and like moving this 3D huh. stuff based on that. Ooh. Okay, and you can do that only with one line detecting a face on a video. Yes, that's crazy. <laughs> so you can have an element like this, which is extending the video element, and I'm like we created this attribute called what. So what do you want to track? I want to track a human, uh, because you can also track a color if you want. Uh, and what do you want? Like what part of the human? I want to track the frontal face. It's pretty much what I have. So detecting a face on an image, it's not an easy task. Uh, and detecting that on a video which has like 32 frames or 60 frames per second, it's, it's a lot of uh, computer work. It's like, poof. You know, it's like you can create so much stuff. And there's so many, like, I'm pretty sure all of you like think about some crazy idea that you can just put in a tag. Uh, but that really opens a lot of possibilities. <laughs> Um, and how can you create your own stuff? Like, okay, I'm so, I don't want to use that. How can you create your own stuff? Like, if you want to go with Polymer, uh, there's this boilerplate for you. You can just uh, go on GitHub and clone that repo and start playing with that. If you want to use XType from Mozilla, uh, there's also a boilerplate for that. If you want to just play with plain JavaScript, no libraries, no Polymer, no XTypes, we put together this boilerplate for you as well if you want to just clone that. Uh, but if you don't like cloning stuff and changing manually, you can use this Yoma generator. 
So you could just go to your command line and type yo element and I want to scaffold an entire repo uh, because I want to share this on GitHub later. So what I want to use, I want to create like a Polymer element. What is the GitHub repo? It's gdgla. What is the username? What is the name of the element? Description, lifecycle callbacks. Boom. I have all the files scaffolded for me. I already have an index that imports my element, defines my element, and I have the Polymer basic structure, so now I can just jump in and start creating my Polymer element. And what is the main reference to learn on that? Like, imagine you weren't here or you just want to jump into this and you want to learn more, what is the place to go? Um, you could just like search on Google and try to figure out like the many articles that they are out there. Uh, you could go to HTML5 Rocks, which has a lot of stuff, and you're not going to find so much, so much stuff because there's a lot of other stuff going on out there. Uh, so, like two years ago, probably, almost two years, uh, like some people from Google, they were like, hey, let's create this place which is going to be like a hub of content for web components. And I saw that, I was like, whoa, this is really awesome. And I like took over the project that we started doing. Uh, so that's pretty cool. And now it's like, we're doing a lot of stuff out there. So if you want to learn more, there's like podcasts, articles. Like every presentation that I see somebody in the world doing, I'll put it there. Uh, like browser support, so just look for that. And this is the message that I would like to like leave with you. Like, uh, I really believe that the best way to predict the future is to create it. And I guess that's a really good opportunity. And not only with web components, like it doesn't matter what are you going with. Uh, the cool thing about these new technologies is that you can just like see it and if you see the value, if you truly believe in that, it's like, this is going to change. Uh, and maybe it's not going to change the entire world, but this is going to change this community. This is going to change this environment. This is going to change the life of those people. Uh, if you believe in that, like, just jump into that and try to create uh, because that's how things are. Like, in the beginning, nobody really cares and then it starts to get really popular and then, boom, everybody loves h uh, and same thing has happened with um, Polymer and all those new projects. So this is the message that I would like to give. And thank you. Thanks a lot for coming. Yeah, if you have any questions. Uh, can you control the Bluetooth devices with uh, Polymer? Uh, so the web, the web platform doesn't have access to Bluetooth yet. Um, Is this spec for it? There's a spec. Yeah, there's probably some spec going on, but like fully implemented. Like I don't believe there is uh, anything uh, right now. Uh, soon. Yeah, soon. In a couple of years. Like, I like you can do a lot of stuff. Like you can connect your computer with like some PlayStation Move control, and then uh, like this is what we did with TrackJS, that other project. Uh, in order to demonstrate the the magenta and the CN colors, we got a PlayStation Move. We we put it on the MacBook, and then we controlled the Bluetooth. But this was the the machine, the like the hardware that was doing that. This was not the web platform. There's no, there's no JavaScript uh, API that you can use to manipulate that. But once there is, you, we can do whatever you would like with that. There is a Chrome API. So okay. if you're, if you're going to stick to Chrome, okay. then you can use that. Yeah. Um, what do you think I mean? How? 
Uh, how far out would be from uh, getting all the browsers on the you know, same kind of level of support so you don't have to you know, do all this you know, components from here, you know, Mozilla's the other way? Yeah, this is a question that always come up and it's a question that doesn't have a right answer. Uh, when HTML5 first came, the predictions for HTML5 to be ready was 2020. I don't know if you guys like were tracking that, but they were like, yeah, HTML5 is going to be ready in 2011. And same with CSS 2.1. They were said like, they were saying that hey, this is this thing is going to be ready in that point of time, and like people were using it all over. And what happens is that the web, uh, the web, the the, the people that make the browsers, if they are really passionate about some spec, something that they, they find it useful, they put it on the browsers and then people start using it. That's what happened with HTML5. And it's the same thing that's happening right now. Web Components is now, it's not available in all the browsers. But Google started Polymer and people were like, broof, jumping into Polymer and using it, it a lot. And the way you can use it nowadays is just putting a polyfill on your page. Um, but like, what I really, like the way I think about this is not like, hey, when, when this is going to be ready for me to use it so I can start using it like in one year, two years, doesn't matter when, like next month. Uh, it's more like, this is what it's going to be. And when this happens, when it comes to the point where everybody can use it, I'm going to already know all of this. And I can like make huge stuff and things that nobody ever thought about. So that's the way I like to think about this. Um, but yeah, the browser report is like, there's no information from Safari. They can come up with the next version with everything implemented and nobody would know. Or they can like take a long time. Uh, but the truth is that nowadays, it's only Chrome fully supported in Opera because it's using the same uh, Blink engine. And like other browsers are implementing different parts of the specs and nobody will know how this, when this is going to be like finished. But it's the same thing with HTML5. There's a lot of APIs that are not ready yet and we're using it. My question is a bit more about, I guess, in the origin. Uh, how did you get into web components, and then how did you become a Google expert? Uh, I was already like uh, doing a lot of, like when I first started, I was like just programming on like on my spot and like not caring about anything. I just cared about like getting a freelance project and like getting more money, and then jumping to another freelance and getting more money. And then I discovered GitHub, and I was like, whoa, this is awesome. I put in my first project out there, and I was like, this is insane. I was working more, I was not making any money, but I was feeling much happier, <laughs> which doesn't make any sense, but I felt much better. Uh, and the reason why I felt much better is because I was learning so much at GitHub than I would learn in any freelance project. Uh, and that started to lead to different things. Uh, uh, when I gave my first talk, I was like, whoa, this is insane, I can just like show the stuff I'm doing and I can teach other people and maybe like change someone's life because someone wants to play with that. Uh, so that's pretty much how I got the, like into this. Uh, and Web Components particularly, I was, I saw one of the talks on the live stream and I was like, this is going to change a lot of stuff. And uh, I want to get into this as soon as possible. I don't want to wait for this to be ready to start using it. I want to create this because I think this is really valuable. That's pretty much what happened. So I hate to cut you off, we're actually going to get no kicked out by security very soon. Okay. So his info's up there. Thank you. Um, okay, so for those of you who have been here before, uh, you're familiar with this. For those of you who aren't, you're not familiar with it. We do a little survey at the end of each meetup. 